Well, welcome to this podcast where we're simply going to review a bunch of problems. We are going to review problems from chapters 11 to 15. And as a brief reminder, that includes calculations relating to isotonicity, um, buffer solutions. We also then talked about Mele equivalents, electrolytes, um, uh, Mele osmolar, so osmolarity. We did some IV infusions and then a lot of calculations on altering product strength where we did algebra and we also introduced allegation and did a lot of altering product strengths using the allegation alternative method. So with that as a little bitty review, let's just work on some problems. So our first problem has multiple parts. And so the problem itself is straightforward. It says a hospitalized patient needs 16 milli equivalents of magnesium to be administered intravenously. So and I show you on the top right kind of a picture of that, uh, the additive bottle we're going to do, do here in the first part. So it says, 1A says, now, to give those 16 milli equivalents of magnesium, how many milliliters of a 20% weight per volume magnesium chloride hexahydrate solution will be needed to provide this dose? And I provide you with the molecular formula and the molecular weight for the magnesium chloride hexahydrate. Okay, so how many milliliters to provide this patient 16 milli equivalents of magnesium? Well, let's start with that. Since that's, that's our target, what we want is 16 milli equivalents of magnesium. So let's first convert the milli equivalents to the number of molecules of magnesium. So let's multiply that by the fact that for every one millimole of magnesium, over two milli equivalents of magnesium. And the two milli equivalents comes as a reminder from the valence. Look on the magnesium, it has a positive two charge. So the valence is two. So you get two milli equivalents of magnesium from every one millimole of magnesium. And we put that on the bottom so those units would cancel. And now we're in millimoles of magnesium. But remember, we're wanting to calculate the volume of this magnesium chloride. So we have to go from the magnesium ion itself to the number of molecules of the parent uh, compound magnesium chloride. So let's multiply that by the fact that for every one millimole of the parent compound on top, which is magnesium chloride, which is the formula MgCl2, from that parent molecule, you can see there's only one magnesium. So for one millimole of magnesium chloride, you would have over one millimole of magnesium. That way the millimoles of magnesium cancel and we're now in the number of molecules of the magnesium chloride. And now this is also assuming the hexahydrate, but regardless from those number of molecules, we can now convert to the weight of that parent compound, the magnesium chloride hexahydrate, because we will multiply the number of millimoles by its formula weight. And the formula weight for the magnesium chloride hexahydrate is given to us at 203. So we have 203 milligrams of magnesium chloride over one millimole of magnesium chloride hexahydrate so that the moles, millimoles cancel and we're now finally in the weight of magnesium chloride. However, we're in the units of milligrams. So let's convert that to grams by multiplying by the fact that in one gram on top, there would be a thousand milligrams. That way the units of milligrams cancel. And I now have my weight of magnesium chloride hexahydrate that I need. What I want though is the volume. So we have to look at the concentration of the solution I'm using. It was given to us as a 20% weight per volume, which by definition means 20 grams per 100 milliliters. So let's multiply by that concentration expressed though as 100 milliliters on top of 20 grams so that the units of grams cancel. And now when I do the math from left to right all the way across, the cancel all of my units, the remaining units would be milliliters. And the final numeric value would be 8.12. So by setting it up and solving of this, we see that we need 8.12 milliliters of this 20% weight per volume magnesium chloride hexahydrate solution to essentially provide 16 milli equivalents of magnesium. And that's the answer to letter 1A. So let's go on a little further with this question down to 1B. It says, if this dose is diluted to a total of one liter with dextrose solution, to give a concentration of 5% dextrose, and again, what we're using to make this is hydrous dextrose with the molecular weight of 198. The question is, what would the osmolarity be of the final solution? Okay, so osmolarity is the amount of osmotic forces that are dependent or generated by particles. So what we need to do is count the number of particles in our solution to be able to determine the osmolarity. 
The good news in this question, it does say the final volume up to one liter. So in terms of being milliosmoles per liter, we're already going to be calculating it for a one liter solution. So that's good. Well, what are the components? What will be the particles in this solution that I'm going to have to, to calculate? Well, from above, obviously, we are going to be having the magnesium and the chloride that we've just calculated. Because again, this solution is going to have 16 mL equivalents of magnesium. So they're of ma uh, mel mel equivalents of magnesium provided as magnesium chloride. So we will have the particles of the magnesium and the chloride. But now we're making it isotonic or we're making a certain tonicity by having this one liter also have 5% dextrose. So we will have dextrose and magnesium and chloride. So those are the particles we need to add up to determine the overall osmolarity. So I'm going to start with the magnesium chloride. Okay, so let's go back to the original question. This solution was supposed to have 16 mL equivalents of magnesium. So with that, let's convert our mL equivalents of magnesium the same way we did before, back to just millimoles of magnesium by multiplying by one millimole of magnesium over the two mL equivalents of magnesium, since the valence is two. Mel equivalents cancel, and we're now in millimoles of magnesium. Again, we can convert from millimoles of magnesium to millimoles of magnesium chloride by multiplying by one millimole of magnesium chloride over one millimole of magnesium, since there's one magnesium in magnesium chloride. Magnesium millimoles cancel, and now I'm in millimoles of magnesium chloride. I know how many molecules of the parent compound magnesium chloride I have. Keep in mind, that's an electrolyte, which in solution will dissociate and expose how many particles. Magnesium chloride, MgCl2, will dissociate and form one magnesium and one chloride and one chloride. There are two chlorides and one magnesium, so one plus one plus one equals three. There are three particles from every one molecule of magnesium chloride. Therefore, I'm going to multiply that my millimoles of magnesium chloride times the fact that I would get three milliosmoles, since there are three particles, three milliosmoles per or over one millimole of magnesium chloride. Millimoles of magnesium chloride cancel, and I end up doing the math from left to right with the number 24, and the units would be milliosmoles. So I get 24 milliosmoles from the required amount of magnesium chloride in this one liter solution. So, the next step would be to determine how many milliosmoles will be produced by my dextrose. All right. Well, let's start with the volume, because I know I'm making a one liter solution, and that one liter solution will be 5% dextrose. So, if I start with my total volume, 1,000 milliliters, and multiply it by my concentration of dextrose, expressed as 5% weight per volume means 5 grams over 100 milliliters. Then my milliliters cancel, and I'm now in grams of dextrose. Next, let me convert from grams to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000 milligrams over every 1 gram. Grams cancel. Now I can convert my milligrams of dextrose to the number of molecules of dextrose by multiplying by the fact that in every one millimole of dextrose, it would have a weight of 198 milligrams. Since the formula weight of dextrose and the hydrous dextrose we're using is 198, now my milligrams cancel and I have the number of molecules of my dextrose. Lastly, I need to think about what kind of molecule dextrose is. It's a non-electrolyte. When you put one particle of the parent compound into solution, it doesn't change. It's non-electrolyte. It won't break apart or fall apart into pieces. It stays together. That means there would be one milliosmole for every one millimole of dextrose, since it is a non-electrolyte. Millimoles cancel, and I'm now in milliosmoles. Doing that math from left to right, I get a numeric value of 253 milliosmoles. That's the amount of force I would get from just the dextrose. So to finish this question, all I need to do is add up the sum of all of my osmotic forces. So let's take the 24 milliosmoles that I get from my magnesium chloride and add to it the 253 milliosmoles I get from my dextrose for a total uh, osmotic force of 277 milliosmoles. And that's the answer to uh, question 1B. All right, let's continue on with Question 1C. So we're still dealing with our magnesium patient here. And this question, 1C, says, if this one liter of solution, the thing we just calculated and made in the previous question, so if this one liter of that solution is to be administered over four hours using an administration set with a drop factor of 20 drops per milliliter, what will the infusion rate be in drops per minute? Okay. 
So this is kind of one of our IV infusion questions here. So where do we start? There's a lot of information. So let's start with the solution we made, okay? What are we trying to infuse? We made a one liter solution. That means 1,000 milliliters. So we're taking that 1,000 milliliters, if you look on the far left, and we're going to administer that over four hours. So I put 1,000 milliliters of solution, that's the total volume, 1,000 milliliters, over the total time, which is four hours. And if you think about those units, even if I don't divide that out, you could divide that out to 250, but if we just leave 1,000 over the four, our units are in milliliters per hour. So we have an infusion rate in mils per hour, but the question wants to know it in drops per minute. So if we just look at the setup of 1,000 mils over four hours, all we need to do is convert milliliters to drops and hours to minutes. And you can do those in any order you want. I chose to go ahead and let's first convert the volume in milliliters to a corresponding number of drops. So I'm going to multiply it by the fact that we were told that our set that we're using, our administration set, delivers 20 drops per milliliter. So if I multiply it times 20 drops per milliliter, then my units of milliliter cancel. And I would essentially be in drops per hour. So the last conversion is to get change the hours to minutes. So let's simply multiply it again by the fact that, and we'll put on top one hour in one hour over the fact that there would be 60 minutes in one hour. And I put hours on top, so my units of hours cancel. And now when I do that math from left to right, my number is 83 and my remaining units would be drops per minute. So essentially a thousand milliliters over four hours can be obtained if you administer this IV at 83 drops per minute. And that's the answer to 1C. All right, last one on this one for this patient, uh, this question with the magnesium. It's kind of an interesting one. It says, this patient needs to receive 30 milli equivalents of magnesium orally each day after leaving the hospital. Okay, they're on this IV form now in the hospital. When they go home, they need 30 milli equivalents of magnesium in an oral form. And how are we going to do that? We're going to use MagOx 400 milligram tablet. So a commercial product called MagOx, which is magnesium oxide, has in each tablet contains 400 milligrams of this magnesium oxide. And I give you the formula of MgO and then the molecular weight of 40. So obviously the question is, how many of these tablets should this patient take to get the 30 milliequivalents of magnesium they need each day? So where do we start with that question? We know our target. Our target is 30 milliequivalents of magnesium. Let's start there and then figure out how many tablets we need to provide that. So on the far left, I say, okay, we want 30 milliequivalents of magnesium. So let's first, just like we've done before, convert the milliequivalents back to the number of molecules of magnesium by multiplying by the fact that there would be one millimole of magnesium over two milliequivalents, because again, the valence of magnesium is two, so it's two milliequivalents. Milliequivalents cancel. I'm now in the millimoles of magnesium. Let's convert that to the number of molecules of magnesium oxide. So looking up at the formula, it's MgO, meaning every one parent molecule of magnesium oxide has only one magnesium. So multiply it by one millimole of magnesium oxide on top over one millimole of magnesium. So magnesium millimoles cancel. I'm now in the number of molecules of my parent compound, magnesium oxide. Let's convert that to the weight of magnesium oxide I need. So let's multiply that by the fact that there are 40 milligrams of magnesium oxide for every one millimole of magnesium oxide, since 40 is its molecular weight. Millimoles cancel, I'm now in milligrams of magnesium oxide. That's how much I need. But we gotta figure out how many tablets. So let's multiply that by the fact that in every one tablet, there are 400 milligrams of magnesium oxide. And I set it up that way so that milligrams of magnesium oxide cancel, and my last remaining units would be tablets. So if I do that math all the way from left to right, I end up with 1.5, and the units would be tablets. So I would have to take one and a half of these 400 milligram tablets to essentially receive 30 milliequivalents of magnesium each day. And while I like magnesium as much as anyone else, I am emotionally prepared to move on to a new question. So here's a new question. And it's about the compounding of a, an irrigation solution. Kind of this antiseptic, something that would kind of keep an area clean if we rinse it with this solution. And the solution, our uh, antimicrobial, if you will, is potassium permanganate. So we want to create a solution of potassium permanganate. Specifically, we want 90 mils. So what we're going to make in the end is a 90 mil solution. That's what we want of this potassium permanganate 
But what is the concentration? You see, this is the trick to this question. Whatever that concentration is, it has to be a concentration such that if I take one teaspoonful, which is equivalent to five milliliters, remember our, our unit conversion, so a teaspoonful is five milliliters. So that volume of this original solution, if we take five mils of that and then further dilute it that with just pure water, so the five mils diluted up to one liter would end up giving us a concentration in the end of one to 20,000, again, which is expressed as a ratio strength. So there's a lot of different things going on in this question. And essentially, it is a double dilution. But so what are we trying to answer? Just be clear. Question two says, how much potassium permanganate will you need to fill this prescription? What that means is how much potassium permanganate do I need to add to my 90 mils such that I get this special concentration? You would think that's where we would start, but let's start at the end. We have to use our final dilution as our starting point. So what do we know in the end? Regardless of how much potassium permanganate I use at first, I know in the end I'm going to get 1,000 milliliters. That's my final volume of my second dilution. That's the volume I'll get. And I want to start there because I know the concentration of that final volume. It's 1,000 milliliters, but I'm told its concentration will be 1 to 20,000. Okay, And since it's a weight per volume, since it's the weight of potassium permanganate in a certain volume in liter here, then I know it's weight per volume. So 1 to 20,000 weight per volume by definition means 1 gram of potassium permanganate per 20,000 milliliters. So if I start with my 1,000 mils and multiply it by its concentration expressed as 1 gram over 20,000 milliliters, and even though that's a big number, I'm staying calm, milliliters will cancel. And 1,000, basically divided by 20,000, gives you a numeric value of 0 0.05. And that is grams of potassium permanganate. That's the mass. That's the weight of the potassium permanganate I have to have in this 1,000 milliliters. Remember, the only source of potassium permanganate is what I added to that second dilution. And what did I add? I added a teaspoonful. I added five milliliters of volume. That five milliliters of volume had to contain all of the potassium permanganate. And since we just calculated that that means that it had 0 0.05 grams, then I know the concentration of my original dilution. My original dilution has to have 0 0.05 grams per five milliliters. That's the concentration of my original solution. Now that I know that, I can figure out how much potassium permanganate I would need to make 90 milliliters of that concentration. So let's start with my desired final or initial volume, the 90 milliliters, and multiply it by the concentration we just determined that we need to have, which is 0 0.05 grams over every 5 milliliters. Milliliters cancel, and when I do that math, I get 0 0.09 grams. And that's essentially my final answer. I need 0 0.9 grams of potassium permanganate. I take that and I dissolve that in 90 mils, all right? When I do that, I get the right concentration. I get a concentration that would be such that if I took 5 mils out of that volume, I would have exactly 0 0.05 grams, such that if I took that 5 mils then and just diluted it again to 1,000 mils, it would give me the concentration of 1 to 20,000. So that essentially answers this question, which is a little bit of a tricky one. I mean, you can see there's not a lot of math here. It's the conceptual idea of starting with the final dilution and working backwards and using your concentrations from the end, going back to find the concentration you need in the middle, just to be able to determine how much drug you had to start with. And that's how we answered this question. All right, let's do another new question. And this question says, how many milliliters of boric acid solution should be used in compounding the following prescription? So let's look over at the prescription. This is an eye drop, an ophthalmic solution. So this is essentially going to be a question about isotonicity. Because what we need to determine here is how many mils of boric acid solution. Well, prescription calls for oxymetazolone hydrochloride at 0.5%. That's our therapeutic agent. That's kind of a vasoconstrictor that's used for itchy eyes, for red eyes, to kind of get the red out. So our active agent is oxymetazolone. We will then use enough of our whatever volume of our boric acid 5% solution, whatever volume we need essentially to make the final ophthalmic solution isotonic. 
Okay. And the, in the end, we're going to add an, uh, enough oxymetazolone with enough boric acid and with a ma with any additional water such that we have a final volume of 15 milliliters. Okay. So, well, where do we start with this? We were given E values for both our active ingredient, oxymetazolone, as well as for the boric acid. So let's use the sodium chloride equivalent method to determine how much boric acid would be required to be able to adjust the tonicity in this final ophthalmic solution. Well, let's first start with our active ingredient though, since we know exactly how much oxymetazolone we need because it's defined by its therapeutic concentration, which is 0.5%. So let's take that percent times the volume of our eye drop that we're trying to make, which is 15 milliliters. So let's take our 15 milliliters, multiply it by the concentration of the oxymetazolone, which is 0.5%, which is 0.5 grams for every 100 milliliters. If we multiply with that 15 milliliters, milliliters cancel, and I can see that the total weight I would need of my oxymetazolone will be 0 0.075 grams. That's how many grams I need to have in 15 mils such that I have a 0.5% weight per volume solution. So that's the amount of my active ingredient. But now as far as the tonicity, what I need to know is not so much active ingredient, but the equivalent amount of sodium chloride that the 0 0.075 grams of oxymetazolone will mimic. Okay, so that's where we use the E value. So let's take our weight of our oxymetazolone, which is the 0 0.075 grams of oxymetazolone. Let's multiply it by its E value. And this is the trick, remember. An E value of 0 0.2 means we have 0 0.2 grams of sodium chloride for every one gram of oxymetazolone. If we set it up like this, the units of grams of oxymetazolone cancel, and if we multiply 0 0.075 times 0 0.2, numerically we get 0 0.015 grams, and now we're in grams of sodium chloride. That's the weight of sodium chloride that our actual amount of oxymetazolone, that is the 0 0.075 grams, mimics. It's the equivalent amount of sodium chloride osmotically. So now that we know how much we have equivalent in, from our active ingredient, we need to step back and say, well, wait a minute, what's my target for sodium chloride? How much sodium chloride would I need to make 15 milliliters isotonic? Well, remember an isotonic solution has 0.9% sodium chloride. So let's set up a proportion where we have 0.9 grams of sodium chloride for every 100 milliliters and set that equal to some X grams of sodium chloride over what we're making, which is 15 milliliters. So if we solve for X, cross multiply and divide and solve for X, we see that X equals, that is our total target for sodium chloride would be 0 0.135 grams. So if that's our overall target, let's take our target 0.135 grams and subtract from it the amount we are getting from our oxymetazolone, which we said was an equivalent amount of 0 0.015 grams. We subtract that and see that we still need to obtain 0 0.12 grams of sodium chloride. What are we going to use to provide that amount of sodium chloride? We're going to use boric acid. So we need to find an amount of boric acid that is equivalent to 0 0.12 grams of sodium chloride. So let's start with that target, which is now 0 0.12 grams. That's our target for the boric acid. Let's take 0 0.12 grams of sodium chloride. Multiply it by the E value for boric acid, which we said was 0 0.52. But now we got to set it up differently. This is where I said you got to make sure you put the units correctly with the E value. So I'm going to multiply that by the fact that I know for every one gram of boric acid on top, there would be 0 0.52 grams of sodium chloride. And I set it up this way so that my units of grams of sodium chloride cancel, and I'm now in grams of boric acid. And I'm almost there. But I'm not going to weigh solid boric acid. I'm going to get my boric acid from a 5% weight per volume solution. So let's use that 5% to convert my weight of boric acid to the overall final volume from this solution. So I multiply it by a, the fact that a 5% solution means 5 grams per 100 mils. So I'm going to put 100 mils on top over 5 grams of boric acid. That's my 5% concentration expressed such that my units of boric acid will cancel and my final units would be milliliters. So now when I do that math from left to right, your final answer would be 4.6 and the units would be milliliters. So we need 4.6 milliliters of a 5% boric acid solution. 
that volume of that 5% boric acid solution provides us the equivalent amount of sodium chloride we need such that when it's added to our required amount of oxymetazolone, the final volume of 15 mils would be isotonic. All right, well, thanks to our perfectly compounded eye drops, I can clearly see now that it's time for another question. So let's keep moving. Question number four says, and before I read, before I read the question, let's look at the prescription. Because the question is a little confusing. We have a prescription here. We have a formula, a recipe to make a zinc oxide ointment. And the recipe we have says to take zinc oxide and calamine, AA 2.2 grams. What does that mean? The Latin abbreviation means of each. So we need 2.2 grams of zinc oxide and 2.2 grams of calamine. And we're going to add 60 grams of petrolatum, which is the ointment base. So to that recipe, to that formula, so that total amount of what we make in that recipe, what the question is saying, well, that gives you a certain concentration of zinc oxide. But I want to take that formulae and add some amount of 20% weight per weight zinc oxide ointment, okay, that we already have. We already have 20% weight per weight. We're going to add it to this recipe and mix it all together such that we get a total concentration of 12.5% weight per weight. So, and it says in big bold letters there to use allegation. So we have a high strength. And in this question, 20% will be our high strength. We have a low strength, which is our formula, the recipe we have there. And unfortunately, we still don't know. It doesn't tell us what percent that is. We're going to have to do that. But to our formula, which is a low percent, we're going to add 20%, which is a high percent, and we're going to come up with something in the middle. And what we want in the middle is we want the combination to be 12.5%. And that's clearly an allegation type calculation, allegation alternative. So, but before we can jump to the allegation, I know you're excited, but we got to do something first. We need to know what the percent of zinc oxide is in our recipe and in our formula that we were given. So let's do that first. So to calculate the percent of zinc oxide in our formula, let's start with our total weight. Our total weight of our formula is going to be the 2.2 grams of zinc oxide plus the 2.2 grams from the calamine plus the 60 grams from the petrolatum. So 2.2 plus 2.2 plus 60 equals 64.4 grams. That's the total weight of our product, our recipe formula that we have when everything's mixed together. Now, to determine the zinc oxide concentration, we need only essentially put the amount of zinc oxide, which was the 2.2 grams, over the total weight, which was the 64.4 grams. That is the concentration. But let's express it as a percent concentration. So if we know in our formula we have 2.2 grams of zinc oxide over every 64.4 grams, let's set that equal to some X weight of zinc oxide over 100 grams of the base. By solving now for X, we'll determine the weight of zinc oxide, the proportional weight of zinc oxide we would need to make 100 grams be the same concentration as what's called for in our recipe. And since 100 grams is a, per hundred, is a percent, that will give us our percent zinc oxide concentration. So if you cross multiply and divide, solve for X, X equals 3.4, or essentially 3.4%. And that's essentially what the recipe calls for. The recipe we were given in the prescription calls for a 3.4% zinc oxide ointment. That's the concentration we're going to mix with a certain amount of 20% to make, it, in the end, 12.5%. So now we can finally jump to our allegation. So I'll remind you with the allegation, I'm going to put my high strength concentration on the top. So there's my 20% directly below it, but down a ways, I'm going to put my low concentration, which was the 3.4%. And then to the right and in the middle, I'm going to put my target concentration, which was 12.5%. Okay, then I'm going to set up my arrows and starting from the top left with the 20%, I'm going to go down diagonally and cross subtract. So 20% minus the 12.5% gives me 7.5. And that answer gets written in the lower right hand side. And again, we drop the units when we do this cross subtracting, we're now in parts. So 20 minus 12.5 gives me 7.5 parts. Okay, and that's directly across from the 3.4%. So now, starting with the 3.4%, let's go diagonally from the lower left up to the upper right, cross subtract, so 12.5 minus the 3.4 gives me 9.1, and I write that number in the upper right-hand side directly across from the 20%. 
So what I now know is to make this proportion of the 20 and the 3.4% such that I get 12.5%, I need 9.1 parts to be the 20% and I need 7.5 parts to be the 3.4%. But remember we want to set those individual parts over the total. So the total would be the 9.1% plus the 7.5. So 9.1 plus 7.5 equals 16.6. .6. So let's reset up our fractions that for the 20%, I need 9.1 out of 16.6 .6 parts to be 20%. And down below, I see that I need 7.5 out of 16.6 .6 parts to be the 3.4%. Now I've got my proportion. How do I actually solve this? Well, I either need to know, I need to know something else. What I know, I do know something. I know the total weight of my 3.4% ointment. I know from my formula, when I calculated its percent, then when I add up all those weights, I will have a total weight of 64.4 grams. So that's the weight that represents all 7.5 parts of my 3.4%. My so going down to the 3.4%, let's use the ratio that we said for parts, that I need 7.5 parts out of a total of 16.6 .6 parts, and set that equal to the fact that I know I'm going to have 64.4 grams of this 3.4% on top, and we'll set that over X. And what we're going to now solve for is how many parts, uh, how many grams, essentially, 16.6 .6 parts would be equivalent if 7.5 parts is 64.4 grams. Essentially, solve for X. So cross multiply and solve for X. And if you do that math, you should get 142.5 grams. And I'll remind you, that's the weight that represents the total dilution that we're going to make. The total weight of our combination will have a total weight of 142.5 grams. That weight, we just said, is equivalent to the 16.6 .6 parts. Well, I can use that weight up above in my 20% because I know I need 9.1 parts over the 16.6 .6 parts. So let me go set up a proportion there. And now I can say that that's equal to some X. Again, I don't know how much of the 20% is zinc oxide. But I now know what my total will be. My total will be 142.5 grams. So now, once again, I can cross multiply and divide and solve for x. And now when I solve for x, I get a number of 78. And that 78 is the grams of 20% that I need to mix. So I now, and that's the answer to this question, it wanted to know how many grams of the 20% to use. So if I take 78 grams of 28%, and mix it with the 64.4 grams of my 3.4% that's called for in the recipe, and I goosh all that together, I get a total weight of 142.5 grams, but that weight would have a concentration of zinc oxide that's equal to 12.5%, which is what our target was. And that's why it answers this question. All right, let's move on to another allegation problem, this time using liquids. So the problem reads, you need to prepare 250 milliliters of a solution containing 40% dextrose using solutions that contain either 50% dextrose or 20% dextrose. How much of each solution do you need to use? And I remind you, we're going to choose to use the allegation alternative method to answer this question. So pretty straightforward. We have a high strength, meaning 50% and a low strength, meaning 20%. And what we want is something in the middle. And specifically, we want 40%, which is in the middle between those concentrations. And we want a total of 250 milliliters of that 40% solution. So with that, let's go ahead and set up our allegation. So we'll start on the upper left with our 50%, which is our high concentration. And then directly below that and down a ways, we'll put our low concentration, which is 20%. And then we'll put our target, the one, the concentration we want, in the middle between those two and slightly to the right. And our desired concentration is 40%. So the next step is to start and with our high concentration. And we'll follow the diagonal arrows down to, from the top left down to the lower right. And we'll cross subtract. So 50% minus 40% equals 10. And I'll remind you not to carry over the units. So we'll put that 10 on the lower right directly across from the 20%. Then we'll start on the lower left and work our way diagonally to the upper right and cross subtract. So 40 minus 20 equals 20. And we'll put that 20 on the upper right directly across from the 50%. So we know we need 20 parts to be the 50% and 10 parts to be the 20%. So the next step is to figure out the total number of parts. So let's just add those up. 20 plus 10 equals 30. So our total number of parts will be 30. 
So really what we have on top with the 50% is saying we need that 20 out of 30 parts to be the 50%. And down below we can see that we need 10 parts out of 30 parts to be the 20%. Now we have our proportion, we have our fraction. The next thing is to set up the ratios that we need. And I'll remind you here, this one's a little bit straightforward because we know we need the total. We have the total parts. We know that thir the 30 parts total has to equal the total volume we want to prepare. And we were told that in the question that the total we want to prepare is 250 milliliters. So for each proportion, we can set it equal to some X volume of the specific concentration over the total volume, which is 250 milliliters. So again, if we just look and focus on the top at the 50%, we have though we know that we need 20 parts of 50% out of the 30 parts total, set that equal to some X of the 50% volume over the 250 milliliters total. We can do the same thing down below for the 20%. We know we need 10 parts 20% out of 30 parts total. So we can set that equal to some X volume of the 20% over the total volume we're going to prepare, which is 250 milliliters. And now that we have those proportions set up, we can solve for X in both situations. So on top for the 50%, if we solve for X, we see that X would equal 166.7 milliliters, and that is of the 50%. Remember, look at the dashed arrows going over from the 50% over to that fraction. So we know that that X equals 166.7 milliliters of the 50%. And down below, for the 20%, when we solve for that X, we see that the 20% we need is equal to 83.3 milliliters. And that is of the 20%. And it should make sense that if we add our two volumes together, that is 166.7 milliliters of the 50%, added to the 83.3 milliliters of the 20%, the total volume would equal 250 milliliters. And we know that resulting concentration of that combination would equal 40%. And that's the final answer to this question. All right, the next question is not an allegation. Uh, it is more of a, a ratio strength dilution question. So let's read the question. It says, an insect venom concentrate for immunotherapy contains 100 micrograms per milliliter. We have that concentration. Now the question says, how many milliliters of water should be added to 1.2 milliliters of this venom concentration to yield a 1 to 100,000 dilution? Okay, so we have a couple of different concentrations here. We have the concentration of the initial uh, venom concentrate, which is 100 micrograms per milliliter. What we want is to eventually take a certain amount of that concentration, namely 1.2 milliliters, add water to it, so we're going to dilute it, and we're going to dilute it a lot. We're going to dilute it so that the final concentration is a 1 to 100,000 dilution. Okay, so hopefully you can view those steps. Start with an initial concentration, take a certain amount of it, and dilute it up. And what we're trying to decide is how many milliliters of water to add to the 1.2 mils to get our final dilution. Where do we start? Well, Let's start with our source of active ingredient. We're starting with that venom concentrate. And what we know that's a fixed amount is we are going to use 1.2 milliliters. And that'll be our source of active ingredient, such that the final dilution of one part to 100,000, that one part has to equal the amount of venom that we're starting with. So let's determine how many, what the actual amount of uh, the venom we would need, because that will determine then how much has to go into our final dilution. So what we were told is that we we're going to start with 1.2 milliliters of this venom concentrate. So we were also given a concentration of that initial uh, concentrate. So let's take the 1.2 milliliters times its concentration expressed as 100 micrograms over 1 milliliter. That way milliliters cancel and I will be in micrograms of my venom concentrate. or essentially the amount of venom in there. Now let's convert our units. I don't like micrograms. Essentially, since I know my 1 to 100,000 dilution is a weight per volume dilution, then I know my units for weight per volume is grams per milliliter. So I can't deal with micrograms. I need to get into grams. So let's convert 100 or let's convert our micrograms units once and I do it one step at a time. So I'll first multiply the micrograms times the fact that there's in 1 milligram 
1,000 micrograms. So again, the microgram units cancel. I'm, I'm now in milligrams. Now I'll convert that to grams by multiplying by the fact that in one gram on top, there is 1,000 milligrams on the bottom. That way the units of milligrams cancel, and now I'm in the grams of venom that came from my initial 1.2 milliliters of concentrate. Well, if that's the amount that I'm going to be starting with, that's the weight in grams of the venom, then if I want to make a 1 to 10,000, or I'm sorry, 1 to 100,000 dilution, what I need to multiply it is by that concentration that I want to make in the end. So let me multiply by that concentration expressed as 100,000 milliliters on top over 1 gram. That is a 1 to 100,000 dilution in a weight per volume. 1 to 100,000 means 1 gram per 100,000 milliliters. And I multiplied it in a way so that my grams cancel, and my final answer will be in milliliters. So if I do that math, starting at the 1.2, working all the way from left to right, my final answer is 12, and the units are milliliters. 12 milliliters. What does that represent? 12 milliliters represents the total volume of this dilution that would provide me the amount of venom I need to get for my initial 1.2 milliliters. So I'll remind you, our answer here is the total volume, not the volume of water to add. That's the total. So the last step is to take our total, 12 milliliters, and subtract the initial volume that's going to come from our venom concentrate. So the venom concentrate not only provides the amount of venom we need, but it also occupies 1.2 milliliters. So we must subtract that. So 12 minus the 1.2 milliliters equals 10.8. And that would be milliliters, 10.8 milliliters of water. So, and that's the answer to this question. What we know to formulate to get the right concentration, a 1 to 100,000 dilution from our initial 100 microgram per mil concentrate, what we need to do is take 1.2 milliliters of that initial concentrate, add 10.8 milliliters of water, mix that together, I would have a total volume of 12 milliliters. And that 12 milliliters of solution would have a 1 to 100,000 concentration of my initial venom concentrate. And that's what we were seeking. All right, our next question reads... How many milliliters of a 28% weight per weight strong ammonia solution having a specific gravity of 0.89, it wants to know how many milliliters of that solution, should be used in preparing 2,000 milliliters of a 10% weight per weight ammonia solution? And that specific, or that solution would actually have a specific gravity of 0.96. So, this is a dilution question. We have a 28%. Again, this time be aware, we're giving our concentrations in weight per weight. But we want to go from 28% down to 10%. And clearly, we would add water as our diluent here. Now, part of the trick is to this question is we're going to want to do this one using the algebra method. So this is where we say the mass 1 is equal to mass 2. All right? So... Well, let's get started and realize, first of all, that this question does involve uh, dilution, meaning that our mass will not change. When we take a certain number of milliliters of our 28% and add water to it, it will certainly dilute that concentration, but it, in the end, won't change the amount of mass present in our final solution. So this is a mass 1 equals a mass 2. And we can rephrase that as saying, since we know mass is equal to the concentration times the quantity, and that means the C1, Q1, concentration of our initial times the quantity of our initial, will equal, in the end, the concentration of our secondary, or our final product, times the quantity that we make of the final product. So the C1Q1 equals C2Q2 is how we're going to approach this problem. The problem here is, is we're given our percentages in weight per weight, but we know our final amount that we're trying to compound, we know that in milliliters or in volume. So let's do this. Let's start at the end and convert our final target, meaning the 2,000 milliliters, into a final weight so that we can match it up with our percents since they are given as weight per weight. So simple enough, we'll start with our final solution that we're going to pre prepare, which is 2,000 milliliters of a 10% solution. Well, we have 2,000 milliliters of that solution, and we were told it would have a specific gravity of 0 0.96. So let's take 2,000 milliliters and multiply it by the fact that that would means there would be 0 0.96 grams per milliliter. 
milliliters cancel. And what I really want to do in the end is prepare a solution that has a weight of 1,920 grams. That's a key. It means the same thing. That weight, the 1920 grams, is the same as the 2,000 milliliters, given the specific gravity it will be. But now we can deal with our final amount by weight. Okay, so let's set up our C1s, Q1s, C2, Q2s, all right? So we'll set our concentration one, our C1, equal to our initial concentration. So what we are starting with is a 28% weight per weight concentration. That equals C1. What is Q1? Q1, we don't know. We're solving for it, okay? However, we're going to set our Q1 equal to some unknown X in grams, this is where it gets important. Since we have concentrations in weight per weight, we need to say our quantity in grams. So we have X grams. Therefore, our mass one will be equal to 28% times X grams. Now let's go to our final product. Our final product, we want to have a concentration of 10% weight per weight. So that is C2. And we just determined above what our final quantity would be. Our Q2 will be equal to the 1,920 grams. And that's what we just solved. Because of our final concentration, that's an equivalent weight to 2,000 milliliters. So our final quantity will be 1,920 grams. And again, now both of my units of quantity are in grams so that they match. Therefore, I can express my mass 2 as 10% times 1,920 grams. And again, since this is a dilution question and mass doesn't change, we can set our M1 equal to our M2. Therefore, I can say that 28% times X grams is equal to 10% times 1,920 grams. Now, if I double check my units, percent and percent and grams and grams, so let's drop the units as we solve for X, we would end up with 28X on the left, and on the right, we would have 19,200. Okay, now if we solve for x, we can divide out by 28. We see that x is equal to 685.7, and the units would be grams. So now we know that the mass of our initial solution that we need to use is 658.7 grams. That's the mass of the 28% concentration solution. We're almost done. But the question wants to know how many milliliters of that solution, not how many grams. So our last step is to use the specific gravity of our initial solution, which we were given to be 0.89. So what I can do is take my final weight that I want of my 28% concentration, which we just said was 685.7 grams, multiply it by the specific gravity expressed as for every one milliliter on top, there would be on the bottom 0.89 grams. And I do that so my units of grams cancel. And if I multiply that out, my final answer would be 770 milliliters. And that's the final answer to this question. That's the volume of the 28% weight per weight volume I would need. And essentially, if I add to it a remaining amount of water up to a total volume of 2,000 milliliters, then that final mixture would have a concentration of ammonia of 10% weight per weight. All right, and we'll finish our last question going back to calculating milli equivalents and milli osmols. And in this question, essentially, if you look on the right-hand side, what we're going to try to do is actually formulate this same commercial product. So there's a commercial product called TPN electrolytes, and it has a combination of five different electrolytes. It has sodium chloride, sodium acetate, potassium chloride, calcium chloride dihydrate, and magnesium chloride hexahydrate. So five different electrolytes in a solution intended to actually be then diluted further in actually a TPN. So that's why it says caution must be diluted because the concentration of these electrolytes in this solution in the 20 mils is intended to have a small amount of that then further diluted into two or three liters in somebody's total daily amount of total perineural nutrition. So it's calculated on their nutritional requirements. So let's try to formulate this exact same ingredient. So over on the recipe or on the prescription, you can see each of the ingredients. I give you their, its chemical structure and the molecular weight and the weight of each ingredient that needs to be contained in a total volume of 20 milliliters. So those are the weight of each electrolyte per 20 milliliters. And that kind of matches this commercial ingredient. And we'll be able to check our answers at the end by doing this. So let's see if we can calculate this. The total of milliequivalents of each electrolyte 
And it doesn't matter whether the electrolyte comes from one or two or three different ingredients. You can see things like sodium are actually going to come from two different electrolytes. Chloride is going to come from four different electrolytes. In the end, it doesn't matter which electrolytes contribute. What we want to calculate is the total number of mole equivalents of each electrolyte and also the final total osmolarity. So with that, let's get started, and we could have picked any electrolyte, but I, let's start with the first one, sodium chloride, and I'm going to set up my answers here in the same format. I'm going to solve these in the same format for each of my five electrolytes. So let's look at sodium chloride, and what we're starting with is 322 milligrams. So I have the weight of sodium chloride. My first step is to convert the weight of the sodium chloride to the number of molecules. So I'm going to multiply 322 milligrams times the fact that one millimole would have 58.44 milligrams, since that is the molecular weight of sodium chloride. Therefore, my units of milligrams cancel, and I can see that doing that math, but it's the 322 milligrams actually provides 5.5 millimoles. Okay, so that weight provides me 5.5 millimoles. From that number, the 5.5 millimoles, I'm going to calculate both the milliosmoles in terms of calculating osmolarity, and I'm also going to start at 5.55 millimoles to calculate the number of each mole equivalent I have. So uh, let's start, and I set these up by first calculating the milliosmoles. So let's start of 5.5 millimoles times the fact that in the chemical formula sodium chloride, when it dissociates, it would produce one sodium and one chloride. One plus one is two, therefore we get two particles from every one parent molecule. So I'm going to multiply by the fact that there would be two milliosmoles for every one millimole of sodium chloride. Millimoles cancel, and 5.5 times 2 equals 11. That means I get 11 milliosmoles from the 5.5 millimoles of sodium chloride. So that's my first step on totaling up my milliosmoles. Now let's determine the number of mole equivalents, and we'll start with sodium. So remember, we're starting with the same number of parent molecules, 5.5 millimoles of sodium chloride. So to convert that to the millimoles of sodium, we look at the fact that there's one sodium molecule for every one sodium chloride. So there's one millimole of sodium over one millimole of sodium chloride. Now I'm in millimoles of sodium. To convert to the number of mole equivalents, I just look at the valence. The valence on sodium is one, so there would be one mole equivalent of sodium for every one millimole of sodium. So I multiply across and I get 5.5 mole equivalents of sodium. Going on to chloride, it works about the same way, 5.5 millimoles of sodium chloride, and the fact that there's one millimole of chloride for every one millimole of sodium chloride. Now looking at the valence on chloride, there's, it's an, a one, so there's one mole equivalent of chloride for every one millimole of chloride. Multiply across, and I also get 5.5 mole equivalents of chloride. So to summarize so far, with our first electrolyte, sodium chloride, we've determined that it will provide 11 milliosmoles of uh, pressure and 5.5 milli equivalents of sodium and 5.5 milli equivalents of chloride. But let's now move on to our next electrolyte. So the next electrolyte is sodium acetate. Now be careful looking at the formula. We're starting in grams, so our, our weight is 2.42 grams. So let's first convert that to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000 milligrams over 1 gram, so that grams cancel. Now I want to convert from the weight of the sodium acetate to the number of molecules by multiplying by the fact that there's 1 millimole over 82 milligrams, since 82 is its formula weight. We're now out of weight, and we're to the number of millimoles. So do that math, and you get 29.5 millimoles. Let's first to determine the amount of osmotic pressure from that. So let's count particles. Looking at the formula for sodium acetate, when it would dissociate, it would have one sodium and one acetate. One plus one is two, so two particles from every one parent molecule. So let's take the 29.5 millimoles for sodium acetate and multiply by the fact that there would be two milliosmoles for every one millimole and multiply and get 59 milliosmoles. Now to determine the mole equivalents, let's again start with sodium. 29.5 millimoles of sodium acetate times the fact that there's one millimole of sodium for every one millimole of sodium acetate. And again times the fact that since the valence is one, there would be one mole equivalent of sodium for every one millimole of sodium. And we get 29.5 mole equivalents of sodium. Same thing for acetate, starting with 29.5 millimoles of sodium acetate times one millimole of acetate for every one sodium acetate. 
gives us than the number of millimoles of sodium of just acetate times the fact that the valence on acetate is one, meaning one milliequivalent of acetate for every one millimole of acetate, multiply out, and we can get 29.5 milliequivalents of the acetate. So to summarize for sodium acetate, it provides us 59 milliosmoles and 29.5 milliequivalents of sodium and 29.5 milliequivalents of acetate. And let's move on to the next electrolyte. The next electrolyte is potassium chloride. So again, looking carefully at the formula, the weight is given to us in grams. So we have 1.492 grams. So converting to milligrams by multiplying by 1,000. And then converting to millimoles by dividing by its formula weight, which is 74.55. So that gives us a total of 20 millimoles. Now to convert that to osmotic pressure, let's count particles. Potassium chloride is KCl. You get one potassium and one chloride. So two particles from every one molecule. So we take 20 millimoles times two milliosmoles over each one millimole gives us a total of 40 milliosmoles. Moving on to electrolytes, counting potassium, we'd start with our 20 millimoles of potassium chloride. The fact that there's one potassium for every one potassium chloride. And again, since the valence on potassium is one, there would be one milliequivalent of potassium for every one millimole of potassium, gives us 20 milliequivalents of potassium. Likewise for chloride, starting with 20 millimoles of potassium chloride gives us one millimole of chloride for every one millimole of potassium chloride, and the valence is one, so one milliequivalent of chloride for every one millimole of chloride gives us 20 milliequivalents of chloride. Therefore, to summarize here, for potassium chloride, it gives us 40 milliosmoles and 20 milliequivalents of potassium and 20 milliequivalents of chloride. Now let's do things a little more, uh, a little more complicated. We'll see. Uh, now that we've moved on to calcium chloride, so looking at the formula, we're starting with 330 milligrams of calcium chloride dihydrate. So we'll convert it from the weight to the number of molecules by multiplying with the fact that every one millimole has its formula weight, which is given at 147. So we're essentially starting with 2.25 millimoles of calcium chloride. Let's count particles. This is where it's a little bit different. The formula on calcium chloride is CaCl2. So there would be one calcium and two chlorides. So calcium plus chloride plus chloride is three particles. Therefore, we're going to take our 2.25 millimoles and multiply by three milliosmoles per every one millimole of calcium chloride. It gives us a total of 6.75 milliosmoles of pressure. Now, to move on to metal equivalents, starting with calcium. Again, we're starting with 2.25 millimoles of calcium chloride, multiplying by the fact that there is one millimole of calcium for every one millimole of calcium chloride. Now, though, looking at the valence, we got to be careful. The valence on calcium is two. Therefore, there are two metal equivalents of calcium for every one millimole of calcium. Therefore, multiplying across, I would get 4.5 milliequivalents of calcium. Doing the same thing for chloride, starting with 2.25 millimoles of calcium chloride, times the fact that there are actually two millimoles of chloride for every one millimole of calcium chloride. Since it's CaCl2, there are two chlorides, so there's two millimoles of chloride for every one millimole of calcium chloride. Now we can still look at the valence for the milliequivalents, and the valence in chloride is one. So one milliequivalent of chloride for every one millimole of chloride, multiplying across, gives us 4.5 milliequivalents of chloride. So to summarize, for the calcium chloride, we get 6.75 milliosmoles and 4.5 milliequivalents of calcium and 4.5 milliequivalents of chloride. So moving on to our last electrolyte, which is magnesium chloride hexahydrate. We'd start with the weight in the formula, which is 508 milligrams, converted to the number of molecules by multiplying by one millimole over its formula weight, which is 203.3 milligrams. Therefore, we get 2.5 millimoles. Again, let's count particles to determine the osmotic force. So magnesium chloride would have one magnesium and two chlorides. So we would be a total of three particles. So 2.5 millimoles times three milliosmoles per millimole gives us a total of 7.5 milliosmoles. Moving on to the electrolytes, starting with magnesium. Again, we have 2.5 millimoles of magnesium chloride times the fact that there's one magnesium for every one magnesium chloride times the fact that the valence is two for magnesium, so there would be two milliequivalents of magnesium for every one millimole of magnesium, multiplying across, and we get five milliequivalents of magnesium. Chloride, we start with 2.5 millimoles of magnesium chloride, times the fact that there are two millimoles of chloride for every one millimole of magnesium chloride, 
then times the fact that its valence is one, so one milli equivalent of chloride for every one milli mole of chloride multiplying across, and I get five milli equivalents of chloride. So to summarize for magnesium chloride, we get 7.5 milliosmoles along with five milli equivalents of magnesium and five milli equivalents of chloride. All right, we're almost done. We have completed all of the individual calculations for each separate electrolyte. Now we just need to add everything up because it really doesn't matter where the things come from. We just need to know the total amount for each electrolyte in our 20 milliliter solution. So I'll remind you, going and starting with sodium, we had sodium from both the sodium chloride and the sodium acetate. So we had 5.5 from the sodium chloride and 29.5 from the sodium acetate. You add those together and we had a total of 35 mL equivalents of sodium. Now potassium only came from the potassium chloride, so we had 20 mL equivalents total of potassium. And again, calcium only came from the calcium chloride, so we had 4.5 mL equivalents of calcium. And again, for magnesium, it only came from the magnesium chloride, so we had a total of 5 mL equivalents. Now, we had a lot of chloride. Chloride came from almost all of those except for the sodium acetate, so we had 5.5 mL equivalents from the sodium chloride, 20 mL equivalents from the potassium chloride, 4.5 mL equivalents from the calcium chloride, and 5 mL equivalents from the magnesium chloride. So adding all of those up, and we had a total of 35 mL equivalents of chloride. And lastly, we had acetate, and it only came from the sodium acetate, so we had a total of 29.5 mL equivalents of the sodium acetate. So those are the total mL equivalents for each of our electrolytes. The last thing to do is to come up with the total osmolarity, and it did want osmolarity, milliosmoles per liter. So two steps. Let's just start with the total number of milliosmoles that we calculated. So starting with the sodium chloride and going through, we first had 11 from sodium chloride, plus 59 from the sodium acetate, plus the 40 from the potassium chloride, and the 6.75 from the calcium chloride, and the 7.5 from the magnesium chloride, adding all those together, gives us 124.25 milliosmoles. And that was per this 20 milliliters of solution. However, we want osmolarity. We want to express the number of milliosmoles per liter. You can do that a couple of ways. I just started, let's take 1,000 milliliters times that concentration. So 1,000 mils times the fact that what we have is 124.25 milliosmoles per 20 milliliters. Milliliters cancel and you multiply across and that would give you the number of milliosmoles that you would have in 1,000 mils or per liter. And that value is 6,212.5 milliosmoles per liter. All right. And that's the answer to this question. But the whole point of doing all this is let's see if we matched our commercial product. So looking at the middle of this picture here where it says electrolytes per 20 ml, this is straight off of the labeling of the product that we based ours from. And did we get the same numbers? I think we did. Sodium 35 and potassium 20 and calcium 4.5, magnesium 5, chloride 35, and our acetate was 29.5. So all of our numbers match those. And you can see there that they determined a calculated osmolarity of 6.2 per milliliter. So keep in mind, there are 6.2 milliosmoles per milliliter. Ours was 6,212.5 per liter. So if we divide our value by 1,000, that would be 6.2125. So once again, our values match. So it's just kind of interesting to see that if you're careful and set this up, and this was just the same calculations repeated, but there's so many different places for mistake. And particularly for the mL equivalents, it has to do with the, the number of molecules of the electrolyte per the parent molecule, as well as the valence to convert mL equivalents from millimoles. So being careful in setting those up and repeating those carefully, and we got the same answer. So hopefully this was a helpful review for setting up these sorts of questions.